Okay, welcome everyone to our fourth um, science policy and engagement workshop. These workshops are really designed to help communities in this cohort, project teams in the cohort, um, develop new tools for enhancing engagement and outreach with their communities so that they have more impact with their projects. This workshop is about community mobilization and we have joining us several people who do this as part of their career and several people who have dedicated kind of a large part of their lives to community mobilization in their communities toward improving um, various issues. I'd first like our um, kind of expert panel, if you will, um, which consists of Dr. Kirsty Dobbs, and Dr. Adriano Udani, um, Harriet Festing, and um, Jessica, um, I am totally blanking on your last name right now, Jessica, Thomas, <laughs> to introduce themselves. After that, we'll launch into about 45 minutes of other experts, experts in actually doing this in their communities, telling you about their experiences, um, each paired with one of the experts I just mentioned. So Kirsty, would you like to kick us off? Hi, my name is Kirsty Dobbs. I'm currently a full-time lecturer at Merrimack College, and I have worked with several community groups through uh, Thriving Earth Exchange and Anthropocene Alliance. And I'm excited to uh, talk with all of you about specifically kind of how to mobilize your friends and neighbors. And um, today we'll, I'll let Dawn introduce herself later, but we'll be doing an interview with Dawn and how she's kind of been able to mobilize her, her neighbors and helping her with community efforts. Jessica. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Thomas. I use she, her pronouns. I am an organizer in the Center for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. So we're a science-based policy and advocacy nonprofit. Um, and yeah, I'm an organizer. I do outreach, uh, supporting our partners, grassroots partners, environmental justice partners, and really trying to bring science and scientists um, as resources to support community in advancing um, stronger health and safety and environmental protections. And I will see, be speaking with the great Rebecca Jim and then also uh, speaking to you all, hopefully in a breakout around um, mobilizing local decision makers. Thank you. Uh, Adriano. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adriano Udani. I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of Missouri St. Louis. I'm also the program director for the Public Policy Administration Program and also research advisor for the Community Innovation and Action Center. Um, I study uh, and work with uh, asylum seekers from Mexico and Central America. Um, I'm looking at uh, accompaniment and how nonprofits and also academic institutions can work with them in rejecting all forms of state-sanctioned violence. Um, today, I have the pleasure of um, introducing and interviewing Terry. Uh, and then later in a breakout room, um, I'm going to focus on um, uh, trying to do collaborative work in, uh, with and in academic institutions. And last but not least, a name many of you already know, Harriet. Hello, yes, sorry, and Critter on, <laughs> on my laundry. Um, uh, so I'm Harriet Festing, Executive Director of Anthropocene Alliance, which is the nation's largest coalition of frontline communities fighting for climate and environmental justice. We currently represent 85 member groups in 32 US states and territories, uh, and they are dealing with or on the front line of uh, climate change, flooding, wildfires, toxic industry, drought, uh, heat. Um, and so we're working with them to organize to help find solutions. Um, and so I am going to be leading the breakout group on partners. We've just helped or are helping today is the deadline for four of our members to put in an application to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which would give them access to significant funding 
and their ability to access that funding, I believe, is entirely dependent on their ability to forge partnerships. Uh, and so one of our roles is to help them bring together the partners that they need, both to access funding, but also to build influence. Wonderful, thank you. So we'd really like this to be a very interactive workshop. So please, if folks have any questions, drop them in the chat. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves at opportune moments. You are all doing community mobilization in various forms. There's a lot of different strategies and techniques for amplifying your work and mobilizing more neighbors, more uh, local officials, more media. Um, really yeah. hoping that today you'll discover some of those. Um, I'd like to start off by inviting Kirsty and Dawn to share their story. Great, thank you. Um, so well, I guess we'll start with Dawn, allowing her to introduce herself and the work that she's doing, which is really kind of my first question for you, Dawn, is could you just briefly describe where you live and the work that you've done with your community over the past year? Hello, everyone. My name is Dawn, and I live in the unincorporated area of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, in a gated community called Island Green. Um, where a third of our community is up against the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge. Um, we have flooding issues and safety issues with our one entrance and exit, and I've been trying to help this community, um, having two developers wanting to add more homes to an already overdeveloped community. And so Don, you noticed kind of right away that this development was gonna have detrimental impacts on not only the wildlife, but the safety of the residents in the community. Can you describe kind of what it was like when you first started this work? What were some of the challenges in getting people on board to support the sort of work that you were doing? And maybe what were some of the things also that kind of came easily in terms of working with your neighbors? Well, I had only just recently moved here, not knowing that um, the community had tried to stop development before. And because I was a renter, a lot of people were not um, thrilled with me trying to um, stop development. Um, they had tried and me just being a renter wasn't a good thing in their eyes until they realized that this was a passion for me, that I wasn't going anywhere. And um, the biggest challenge was unfortunately just being a renter and um, not everyone understanding that I, I was gonna be here for a while and, and this is what I wanted to do. Yeah, so you brought out this, this kind of power dynamic that was taking place. And I think one thing that you really found that you needed to do was to get more people to join and to kind of amplify all of your voices together as a collectivity. Uh, and you had a sort of an initial meeting with some of your community members. I think about nine came over. Can you describe kind of what that meeting was like and what was achieved? Well, it was a hallelujah moment for real. <laughs> you know, um, actually finally getting some people together and, and them realizing that I had a passion for this. And I, I saw that they had the, the same kind of passion. So um, uh, the, the first meeting was great. I mean, we talked for quite a while and, and we all realized this is something we really had to do and, and work on together. And you mentioned something one time that uh... The safety of the residents of development was definitely an issue, but what was the thing that kind of brought people together to kind of connect and around one sort of single issue? Well, everyone is definitely worried about the, the safety issues with the, only the one entrance and exit and the flooding issues. But um, I, that's what the first group kind of focused on. I actually, being a photographer, um, a nature photographer, I realized that we had amazing nature here being so close to the refuge. And 
Um, I'll, uh, and right there is our, our wood stork, was act, which is actually on the endangered species list. Um, I found out that there's no, a, no environmental impact statement was ever done here. So we kind of tried to find out if there was nesting here of them, but uh, we wound up finding a rare bird that's not even a South Carolina bird. And everybody loves the nature here. We have an abundance of nature. So that was our big come together was the, the nature. Which I think is a pretty cool story. It's like the animals and the nature really brought the community together. And so then you, as you started to gain more speed, the, what was the next step for you? It was you put together a protest, correct? Yes. Um, it was to announce, it, well, we had actually found a land trust group that wanted to um, connect with the developer to see if he would uh, give, uh, donate the land so um, they would stop development. And after finding out about the limpkin, um, they're a rare bird here. And um, so we had a protest, a peaceful protest at the entrance of our um, community to let the developer know about our rare bird finding um, because they were in the breeding behavior and if successful it would be the second pair of limpkins uh, successfully breeding in the whole state of South Carolina and we wanted to let the developer know there were other options besides development because of our rare birds here so um, that brought a lot more people to our group. It was forming those other partnerships with the, the land trust and even the birding associations, I think you mentioned before, really kind of made the group feel a little bit more empowered enough to go out and protest. Right. After finding the Limpkins, I, I did contact a birder group. Um, and that's how we actually found the land trust group. And so you got the attention of both the media and your local officials uh, because of that protest. Uh, so then you moved kind of to the next stage and you had organized a town hall where you could actually connect directly with your local politicians. How did the town hall go in terms of gaining more support from your community? Well, um, our, uh, our dis district's uh, county councilman uh, did show up for the town meeting and one person from the planning commission so um, because, it, oh, and we had someone from Fish and Wildlife there as well as an expert hydrologist, Dr. Stephen Emmerman was there. Um, and that brought more community members to our Zoom town hall meeting. And do you feel like after the town hall, kind of what has been the role of the media? Have conversations continued to take place? Oh, we, we definitely try to be in the media as much as possible. Um, we did have um, a reporter do a story on Island Green based basically on the Limpkin living here. Um, but I, I, I do kind of try to make sure we're in the, the media for anything and everything if possible. <laughs> But um, it, it definitely brings yeah, you've, you've, the community more together. Now, you've definitely talked a lot to the media. That you're definitely sort of the, <laughs> like the voice yeah. of, the, <laughs> of the movement. And, but and some, not only, not only uh, television and newspapers, but we've been on the radio as well. Yeah. And the, the radio uh, station that we were being interviewed when um, the day of the protest, um, when they found out about our baby Limpkins, they announced it on the radio, I found out, so. That's pretty cool. Again, it's like bringing those, the animals, the wildlife, really kind of connecting with the community there, which is cool that you're able to identify that. 
Right. Um, and that kind of connected. I think you've done something really unique. And I'd be interested to know if other community members here have done the same. But you've really expressed your political voice through art, like through your photography. Could you maybe explain our, uh, a little bit to the group about the role your photography has played in, in your efforts? Well, um, I definitely take a lot of pictures of the nature here and I share it everywhere I possibly can. Um, in our group, um, birder groups, um, humane societies, um, the Audubon Society, um, uh, just in, anywhere. And um, the community, when they see something new uh, in, in nature, um, whether it be an animal or even, um, well, flooding, we take pictures of flooding as well, um, or um, a new flower or a tree or whatever, we're always sharing it. And I also videotaped um, and documented a natural creek that comes through Island Green that was once thought was a man-made creek. And um, Google Earth has been my friend uh, since the beginning. And I've also found an historical uh, uh, I lost the word um, a logging tram that comes through the refuge into our community. And I've uh, talked to the mu a museum. I've talked to the um, South Carolina Institute for Archaeology and Anthropology, and they forgot about this logging tram. So now it's on record that there's a, uh, a lost logging tram in the uh, Waccamaw Refuge that comes into Island Green. <laughs> It's been great. On one hand, you're this super empowered activist, and then on the other, you're like the local community historian, which I think you're, you're serving dual purposes, which is pretty cool. Is there any other advice that you would give to, to people here who, um, who are maybe starting this work for the first time, who are having a hard time getting people to join their community activism? You will definitely pull your hair out to begin with. It, it's, it can definitely be um, hard work. Um, no one wants to listen to you. Um, but if you have a passion for it, and then others will see your passion, um, share everything. Um, when you start documenting anything and everything and, and your community sees these things, then they'll they'll slowly come on board. It, it will take some time, believe me, I know. But um, I mean, I have friends here that now stick up for me, even if I am a renter. <laughs> so, and they, they all take their own photographs and, and share them as well now. So, I mean, it's not just me trying to hog the limelight or anything, not I was, what I was trying to do at all, you know, but they, they now see what this community, what this neighborhood or, or it, what Island Green has and they're, they've fallen more in love with it, with everything that everyone finds. Thank you for sharing all that. I think Harriet, do you have a question? So I just, I had the honor of knowing Dawn from, you know, before I guess she got connected with the Thriving Earth Exchange. And Dawn, I, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, you spoke so differently, uh, you know, what was it, a year ago? Uh, I got the impression that you felt so isolated and you felt so frustrated that you would put stuff on Facebook and nobody responded, nobody cared. Your mm -hmm. feeling that nobody cared uh, he's my memory. And one year on, I mean, I get notifications every time someone posts something on your Facebook group. And my God, do I get a lot of notifications. Yes. You know, the feeling that you have really transformed 
you know, you so you've not only fought such a good fight, an incredible fight, and got such an incredible tension. I feel from what I've seen is that you have said created a sense of community that didn't exist there before, and a sense of kindness and caringness. And I just, you know, I think you're just incredible. <laughs> I, so I wanted to say that and one other thing so I just spoke to an organization and I won't, won't say their name and I they have small grants for grassroots leaders and so I talked about another grassroots leader that I have just started working with and when I think of this woman who's actually a wildfire impacted community who has had to leave her home um, I think of you and I think of Terry uh, who is also going to talk because of the sort of the sense of isolation that you have had. Um, and this person who has this grassroots fund saying, we can't fund them. If they haven't got this, 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 and this already, we can't fund them. And I just felt so angry because it takes times and requires someone like Kirsty, who has, you know, spent a lot of time working with someone like you to help bring together all these bits so that you're ready to roll. So anyway, thank, so thank you, Dawn. You are phenomenal. And thank you, Harriet, for helping us because it, if it wasn't for you, um, it, I, I feel like you helped the, the, I mean, knowing that someone else had my back, um, the community came together even more. So, um, so I thank you too. <laughs> right, it, the, everything goes to you. you you're incredible. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Harriet, for for jumping in and emphasizing. I think how we've we've all seen you grow so much, Don, over the past year, and your story is amazing to follow. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you. You're amazing too, Kirsty. <laughs> Thank you, but really it's all you. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Dawn at this point in time? We'll have more time in breakout rooms to really dig into the details of what she did, but I think what we've just heard speaks to the power of working with local partners, with your fellow neighbors, with academics, and with local officials. Um, bringing all those strands together is something Don for one, and if there's no questions for Don, I'd invite Terry and Adriano to speak next. Um, Great, thanks Erin. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with and learning about Terry's work. And so I'm, I'm so grateful for this space to um, ask Terry some questions about her work and, um, and, and, and that's sort of how we'll proceed. I think what I'll like to do for, for my segment is, is out of the amazing work that Terry has done to really uh, drill down to talk about local officials, but um, consistent, maybe taking a cue from Kirsty, um, Terry, if, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, explaining where you live and work, uh, and then tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing in your community. My name is Terry Straka, and I'm in um, Socasty, South Carolina, which is near Dawn in the unincorporated area of Horry County slash Myrtle Beach, better known as. Um, but with that, in, in saying the unincorporated, that means we're, we're very underrepresented. Um, and we, we lack a lot of, um, especially emergency funding and things of that nature. Um, and, since 2015, um, and I, honestly, I never had any interest in, in anything. I, 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 knew, I was aware of, you know, climate change. I acknowledged it, um, all of that. Um, but, I, and also too, I was primarily more of a conservative Republican also, which that's changed dramatically over this, this since 2015 as well, because I've, uh, I've discovered, um, and I think the biggest fight that I've had, you know, for my flooded community, which is um, 60 repetitive, multiple um, times we flooded, 
um, 60 homes. There's over 120 homes in, in my area. And, um, but there's thousands along the intercoastal waterway. That's the tributary that we live along, which um, the intercoastal waterway has been um, not maintained properly or effectively by the Army Corps engineers. So that's where you have the inner agencies and um, levels of um, uh, politics that you're dealing with. Because not only do we have, you know, the county representatives that we have to deal with, we have the state, then we also have the federal government, you know, with the Army Corps engineers, and none of them are easy to work with individually and particularly um, in unison, so to speak, because um, our flooding was blamed on multiple things um you know unnatural unrecorded um rainfall to blaming um duke energy um dams which who knows what it can be and that and that's where you need science um it's a very it was it's very imperative that you have science based information and statistics and um involved as well it, and also you need to have you know um your universities your educators involved to get represented to 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 even be heard because that was the problem is um we were a working community so no one wanted to listen to us um essentially everyone was just sitting back here and we just kept flooding and flooding and, and no one wanted to they'd say oh yeah those poor people back there in rosewood they always flood um which that's no excuse um and that's what kept me um going is that i know that there are there's projects there's plans there's grants there's money there's answers that it's out there and um it's achievable and so you you I couldn't give up um, like a lot of people would do, you know, and, th and that goes into the issue of gentrification. You know, there's a lot of that here. There's a lot of discrimination, racism, um, and, you know, and not just race itself. Also, there's class war warfare here as well. So I don't know. Did I ever speak? I, I can. I told you I do that. <laughs> no, no, that's that's what that's what I want. That's that's great. I, I I just think that there's so much to learn just from these conversations. But if if I could, um, you know, to to focus in on the the local officials and your experience with local officials, um, you've said this, and I think this bears out in the in the data as a political scientist that local officials are strange and complicated, um, and um, you know, you talk about how you're this need to understand where they're at. Um, and it's, you know, it's not easy. So continuing a converse, a theme that I, I heard from the first conversation about how do we get people to care about our work? Um, could you talk to us about how you got elected officials or local officials to care um, about your work and about your community in light of how, you know, your community has been painted incorrectly and, and unjustifiably. Um, could you tell us more about, about how you, how you uh, sort of work with local officials? Well, I, and, and, I, and I had to stay, you know, politically active and, um, you know, stay current in the, in the news and things like that to stay at their level, um, to know, you know, where their minds were, you know, what their policies were. And, um, because I, I, you know, it's not really social issues per se, or, you know, um, everything is, is money-based. And so um, I had to, to get them, you know, to interact, so to speak. I had to um, put down myself somewhat to get to their level. <laughs> but also, you know, um, to get along with them because I really didn't, I really didn't want to get along with them. I wanted to, you know, fight and be combative 
and um you know not necessarily aggressive but assertive because i knew um but I, but I, you can't get anywhere with them like that so you know i i would just have to be con you know condit just let them know i know what they're working with and yes their troubles and and you know they don't have enough manpower they don't have enough money they they don't have the people suited to get, you know write projects or things like that so i would just try to get to to them and just talk with them and then let them know and and if they didn't know then i could inject you know some education or some information to them that they're always willing to look at or to get someone to look at later and and you know really it's the people that are working behind them um that you can get through more so um they're more willing to listen and um if it doesn't make them look bad they don't want to look bad ever and so you know when you have opportunities um you know like i utilize every flood instance that we had every storm instance that we had I, I i got it all across the media i made you know very good friendships and relationships with the media they are key they're crucial um and so uh that's how i kind of shamed them so to speak because they were forced they they have to react to that but particularly when you know the reporters um, would go to them and ask them for a statement, which I was very fortunate to have that happen as well. Um, because, of, and you know, you get the typical excuse, oh, we're going to look into that. We're going to take care of that. And, 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 and that's the biggest thing. That's the hindrance is um, breaking through those, you know, the red lines um, to get um, increased um, action quickly. Um, instead of just sitting and, and, and waiting, you know, most people will just sit and they just accept what they say or their excuses or what have you. And then they just move along and they just think that nothing can be done. And, and that's why I'm so grateful for, you know, this community and with Harriet and everything else, because that gave me the strength um, and the knowledge and for the power to continue on and to not give up. And, um, because I knew there was money there and I was going to get it. I, you know, even if it was, wasn't going to be enough, um, I was going to get, I, I had to break that, um, pattern, you know, um, of them saying that they didn't have it or they couldn't help. And, 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 and that's just caused, and, and that's caused them to now they've opened up, you know, with, whatever excuse they want to use, whether it be coronavirus or whatever, but now all this money is being injected. You know, I, I thank the Biden administration and, you know, for the, for what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. I, I, what I love about your work and learning about it is that, you know, you, you use a, a multi-pronged approach. I mean, there's, there's street yeah. protests. There, there, there. You're, you're sort of coordinating media attention, uh, social media in terms of Twitter storms, uh, and then also just uh, coordinating a, a uh, like a, a, an engaged Facebook group. So, um, you know, it's it's sort of on on all different fronts, and, and it speaks to this idea about leveraging, creating these leverage points on media um, to let you know these local elected officials have their limelight, but then um, hold their um, hold them accountable when you have their attention. Um, I, I was wondering if you could talk more about this idea. Um, you know, you talked a lot about navigating these political spaces that, you know, were adversarial to your own beliefs, uh, who may actually not believe in, in, in science. Um, could you, could you share some strategies, both in terms of like, I, I guess we talked about your strategy in terms of, of work, but, but even just like your, your personal strategy, how do you, how do you take care of yourself? Because I, I'm sure it takes its toll uh, on, on you personally and, 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 and your ability to maintain composure uh, with people who, you know, have said some, you know, pretty awful and, mm -hmm. and, and, and controversial things like, Tell us more about how do you sit down at the same table? What are some important qualities or characteristics to have to have those difficult conversations? 
Um, meditation is key. <laughs> Reflection, meditation, and education. <laughs> yeah. And 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 that's the thing. Um, you know, I because mental health is so overlooked on every level with any of us with any of the work that we do you know it's it's just mental health is is overlooked and um so I try to um you know decompress and um I do have probably what they would classify as multiple personalities (laughs) because I can be um, I was I was a very clever child, and I knew how to work things. So, and I and I knew, you know, sometimes you have to put yourself aside, um, and, you know, for the common good. Um, so I, uh, that's just how I managed it. Um, I've had to say and do a lot of things, you know. Like I said, I I I, I always have, I pretty much had a very peaceful life. On, and, until the flooding started and then you know I became very very angry I was so angry and I wasn't just angry necessarily I was angry at the environment itself the environment that I love you know I love this place I love the waterway I love everything about nature and um fishing and hunting and you know I do all them things I'm not this little frilly girly girl so it was it was really difficult for me to and I and I don't even think I'm necessarily completely over it all you know um because sometimes I think to myself what the hell are you doing or where are you going or what you know I don't know I just take it as it comes and and so that's how I deal with a lot of people you know um I had to physically, you know, help a lot of people as well in, in being a caregiver. So, um, that helps also mentally and, um, and also relating with other people and different, um, ideas and principles, you know, um, and I'm, I'm very, I'm very, I've, I've experienced discrimination myself on many levels. And so I look for it and I try to combat it and it's there. It's all over. Um, you know, I've watched my people, you know, residents in my community, you know, be discriminated against, you know, whether it be their sexuality, their religion, Uh, their nationality, you know, I've got all of these things. I mean, it's just been like a Skittles bag just popped open and, you know, I'm dealing with all these things and it's just, it really is overwhelming, but then too, it's also, you know, what, what else is there to do? I mean, what, if I was not to be here and, and I'm not saying that I'm, you know, I, I guess I was just put here for a reason and so, you know, I have to carry through with it and, you know, and that's just, that's how I build my strength and my endurance. And it just, and, and it's motivated me also to start to think, I don't think inside a little simple box or a circle, you know, if, you know, just like with the protest, I was like, okay, let's go. You know, what do we want to do? I'll go to McMaster's door. I'm not, you know, I, it's not that, you know, and I don't think that that wouldn't you know, that that would be offensive to people, you know, people, if he doesn't want to listen, then I'm going to, I'm going to make him listen. You've got to get him to listen, Mm -hmm. you know, and if that means standing outside, you know, the governor's mansion, holding a sign for 12 hours, well, then you got to do it. Right. Yeah. We, We have to, we have to be creative and, and, um, not, and not fearful, you know, don't break the law, but you know, you got to do certain things you know I've had arguments with you know I think I told you I tried throwing rocks at Trump when he rode through my neighborhood you know and I didn't care it was just to get his damn attention you know he stood there and he told the people you know in Conway he told them oh yeah just some people are gonna have to move well then damn don't come to the, around here telling people that when I heard that I was like oh hell no and he's gonna ride through my neighborhood and we were flooded out and you know tearing out our homes so 
I said the heck with it. When he rode by in that limo, I did. I tried throwing rocks at him and Tom Rice stopped. I was like, Terry? And I was like, no, Tommy's not doing it. <laughs> well, um, I, I think we're at time, but as you all can hopefully tell, uh, Terry has been a wonderful wealth of, um, of information and, and inspiration. So Terry, thank you so much. Um, no, thank you. Uh, for your time and I'm going to hand it back to, to Aaron. Thank you and I'd first like Harriet to point out what she just put in chat because I mean that's some serious com community mobilization when you can raise 13 million dollars to buy out homes. Yes so I mean wow Terry <laughs> uh, and I know it that you know getting the 13 million one thing I've learned from you is despite the win on that you're still dealing with terrible stress of ongoing flooding the disbelief mm -hmm. among your neighbors that the funding will ever actually be released it's made more stressful for you than i had ever envisaged but yeah <laughs> you know as thus far a success story and, and and so what was most interesting was that we had a, a meeting with a county official who was running the buyout program and she said the reason that rosewood the the subdivision that um, Terry has been advocating on behalf of got that money is because she knew that Terry's group was organized and she knew therefore that a buyout program would go smoothly and that they had the partners that they would need uh, to help make that happen. So it was absolutely no doubt because of Terry's advocacy that they got that buyout funding. <laughs> wow. Well, you too. But yeah, that's another thing too, is you, you try, try to stay one step ahead of everything. You know, we, with Harriet and, and, and the buy-in team and everyone, we pretty much had the buyout program already done for them. <laughs> so. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Jessica and Rebecca. And Rebecca has been organizing her community for what, two decades now? So speaking about being organized and ready for action. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so I think we just want to start with Rebecca, could you please sort of introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, your community, its history, um, and some of the issues you're working on? Sure. Um, so hi, Ergun. <laughs> um, I've, I've been so um, intrigued by hearing the stories of my now my teammates um, that I, I feel re really humbled. Um, so I am a Cherokee woman uh, and I live on the Cherokee reservation on land that is a, uh, and will be a tall grass prairie uh, as it becomes home again. Um, I, but I work, um, uh, 25 miles away in one, <laughs> in one of the most uh, contaminated sites in the country. And so I think uh, where I live and where I work has um, been a big uh, part of why I do the work I do. I, I truly believe that everyone should have the ability to, to come home to a safe place where the ground will not cave in beneath you, where the water does not run orange, where um, the soil that you might want to plant your garden is good. Uh, I have all of those things and I believe everyone else should have it too. And so um, I have worked at this, the Tar Creek Superfund site at the edge of it um, for um, most of my adult working life. And what I saw is visible. I mean, you can visibly see the issues there uh, with piles of uh, mine waste that's, that's loaded with lead and zinc and other heavy metals. Um, you can see them from space. Uh, and and they, they've been there uh, for now over a hundred years uh, as they 
is they went from uh, beneath the ground to above the ground. And by doing that, being available, bioavailable to uh, children and the community members that live near and, and um, uh, near that space. And so, uh, I, I, um, so one of the first things that we wanted to do was to help uh, in every way we could to lower the lead levels in the children at our site because we had determined that one third of our Indian children were lead poisoned years ago. And so the, the emphasis has been with the help of EPA to reduce those lead levels. And, um, and they have come down, but we're still higher um, by half um, um, the, the level in Oklahoma. We're, we're twice the level of, of what the average town in Oklahoma is for lead poisoning in, in their children. And so um, that, that's been a forever thing and will continue to be because of uh, the way uh, we were able to expand the boundaries of the Superfund site and make it uh, go beyond um, what EPA had determined and make it be the whole county. And um, so that's, that's a piece of it. But the other piece of it is the fact that the creek running through the Superfund site is Tar Creek and that creek floods. And that creek, when it floods, brings um, more heavy metals down through communities and floods homes and yards and playgrounds uh, all the way through this site. So uh, I do wanna tell you this project that we've been working with Thriving Earth has been um, an eye opener to me because uh, we had wanted to do a project that would help our flooded people like Terry's dealing with, flooded people that, the, uh, uh, that have not been flooded yet, um, have them have a map that could help them understand when and how high the water is gonna be when it comes. Um, because we know that's gonna happen with climate change, but also with political actions by our, our Army Corps and its relationship with one of our senators. And so um, I naively thought this map would be that thing that could help our flooded people understand. Them. But when you look at the bigger picture, when you look at that, at that map, when you look from far away, when you see it from the county side and not just the city side, all of a sudden, when you imagine the water from the, the next big flood and you see where it is and how it inundates the chat pipes, which are, are loaded with lead and zinc, and how that's also pulled into the creek and is now flowing, even not just the heavy metal water we know comes, comes down that stream every day, but now we know by looking at this action that the map shows us, is that this each time it floods, we're getting dosed with lots and lots of these mine tails that we didn't know was happening. And so I'll turn the page. So what can we do with that? Um, that's, that's the action now, is to uh, use that map, not only to educate our people who have not been flooded before, but to use that map to also, as a tool to, uh, for our politicians, for our uh, EPA and, and state and federal officials to see what we see. And that is, this is bigger than they've been doing. I mean, there's, there's more to this story that they have not been doing. And so, um, which brings me to the next thing that we're doing, and that is organizing 
um, uh, uh, we're organizing the people in Miami, Oklahoma to care about this group. And we're doing that as, um, as an initiative petition drive. And we're getting people to sign up for this ordinance that we're trying to get passed by the city of Miami. And we're trying to do that. And I think we can do it. We are, um, uh, what we've discovered is after 42 years, people are finally tired of that creek being dead. They are really finally thinking, well, that's just not right. And they are going, not a single person that sees our petition says no. <laughs> and um, so we were able to add a page for our people that cannot sign it because they're not official voters. Maybe they, for religious reasons, aren't registered or for whatever reason are not registered voters. Um, so they're, they're signing their own special sheet as friends of Tar Creek. And so this little creek who had no friends, but just some little old Cherokee woman <laughs> and her little buddies has got a whole lot of friends that she didn't know she had. And uh, we believe that um, this is gonna help her get her standing as, um, as valued once again in the community. Uh, and if our, our ordinance passes, we believe um, that uh, polluters will be caught more easily. And uh, every single individual in the community is finally saying, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a polluter. <laughs> Ooh, am I doing it? And they're thinking about what they're doing to their own properties. People that own land right along the creek are saying, I better walk my, I better walk along there and make sure I'm not doing it. Um, so, um, yeah, all of that happened. I, I really want to tell you, I'm aiming this little pointy stick at Harriet. Harriet Bestick. I'm giving her a lot of credit and she won't want it, but hey. I'm like you, Terry. I'm like uh, anyone she's messing with. She, <laughs> she's, she's pulling our strings and pushing us to do beyond what we thought we could do. Okay. And so, because she's doing that to me, I'm doing that to the whole community. And I think that's what Terry's doing. Uh-huh. I think that's what, is it Dawn? I think that's what she's doing. Uh-huh. And um, so that's pretty cool. And I, I know I've probably talked too long, but I do want to tell you that uh, we are working with um, Cedar with, um, and trying through this ordinance, through the back door, using um, the, the local lawyers that we have in our state that have uh, looked at every little detail on how we can give Tar Creek rights. And so we're doing it in a, in a way, um, it's not as fully vested as we'd like it to be. But um, what we're doing is if, if someone should pollute Tar Creek, then she becomes a victim. And as a victim, doesn't she gain person? So anyway, it's, it's all good and we are happy and people uh, feel like they're getting a turn and we may or may not get this passed. And it may be that the county, I mean, the city will just pass it and we don't get to take it to the ballot. But, um, uh, we've, Tar Creek got some friends and, um, and that's worth a lot. And we believe it will help us, uh, let EPA EP, and FERC and Army Corps and, um, understand that, um, 
there's people that care now that didn't ever say it before, but harbored it, wondered about it, worried about it. And um, yeah, so that's really good. And I'm very happy. And um, so thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. Erin, I don't know if we have maybe two minutes. I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up. Well, <laughs> we could make it quick, hopefully. Um, Rebecca, about the role of scientists and technical experts in that work um, with you and how they have been key and where there's been a little bit of struggle and just any advice you might have for other folks. Oh, well, I'll tell you. Um, if you can have... So sorry. I get these phone calls where they want to make sure I'm awake. Um, and in, well, I'll tell you, the science, if you don't have scientists, you should get artists. Uh, but, but if you can have both, you've got it, okay? Because um, what the scientists can do, the artists can show you mm -hmm. or tell you or write a poem about or... Um, somehow bring you into the heart of what makes this different. So yeah, science, you betcha. <laughs> and map makers. Yeah, the folks with GIS or geographic information system, geospatial analysis skills are really, Kalesh, I was hearing you talk about having that map and just that visual being so key to what, you know, to, to really taking in the impact um, and the connection of everything, so. The, the one other thing that we have that um, happened last Wednesday was uh, the Inter-Tribal Council with nine of the tribal leaders represented in our county. Um, they um, passed a resolution adopting our, our ordinance. So it's really nice. That's the other piece we have to have is to have the tribes with us. Sorry, they, they adopted the, the ordinance, did you yes. say? Mm -hmm. um. in, in the presence of the city manager. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Amazing. Amazing. Mm -hmm. It would be, um, sorry, I'm talking, I'll, I'll shut up. But um, so, so uh, Terry, and Dawn have also been matched with scientists, but in both cases, almost for, you know, they've been working a year. Well, of course, you, Rebecca, have been working for, for decades on the issue before you, well, and I think you've always been working with scientists. Um, but it would be good to get a sense from Terry and Dawn as well about, about how that's worked. And, you know, I think for both of you, you've been working with scientists for the first time. Yeah, I, I think it, you know, is instrumental, like she mentioned, the maps, you know, giving maps can say a lot and not, and just like she explained, not just to a certain set of people. Um, and, and that's what we've done also. And, um, and we're actually working on one probably similar to yours, Rebecca. So yeah, they're, they're key. Um, to give warning, but also to, to show existence, um, because that's what you have to get is you, you have to get um, the credibility of existing to begin with, because a, a lot of people want to say, oh, well, no, that's not happening, or oh, no, that's not there, because they can't see for them themselves. That's the educating part is showing them yes it's here it's you know and it's happening um i think that's a big thing with just climate change in itself also is that you know because they don't see it um they don't give it credit so mm -hmm. it doesn't exist to them so anything that happens within those perimeters it's just it's not real to them <laughs> you know unless they are a victim and, and I'm, I'm big on, you play that victim. It's okay to be a victim. You know, um, I've not, I, I'm not afraid to be a victim. And, you know, that's where the strength comes in too, is, you know, a lot of people are afraid 
you know, they're afraid to say anything, mm -hmm. um, which to me is crazy because I say too much. And uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but um, so I guess, you know, you can balance that a little bit. <laughs> But, you know, I have people right now today, they, they won't say anything. And it's like, come on, I just, you know, we, they just won't. And it, it breaks my heart that, you know, they just, they suffer in silence and just wait. And, um, and so that's why we need, you know, we need each other. And, you know, it's a communal thing that um you know and act, well anyone that does activism knows that you have to have even if it's just one person you know that can um make things legitimate and and that you know that you can lean on <clears throat> but anyhow sorry <laughs> I agree with Haley. That was beautifully said, Terry. Um, we are an intimate enough group that I think maybe we'll skip breakout rooms, although we have quite a few people on the line, including Liz and Olivia, who many of you know from previous calls are with us. They're also part of AGU and um, have a lot of experience in sharing science and working with policy officials. So if anybody wants to disappear into a breakout room and workshop something in particular, let me know and I'm happy to make that happen. Otherwise, I'd love to hear from everybody else who's on the line. Um, Michelle, Nicole, let's see who else is here. Um, Anna, Garrett, um, how has this resonated with your experience working with and in the communities that you're working with? Norma especially as a, as a policymaker yourself. Hi, thank you. So yeah, I straddle, I straddle these roles of um, elected, local elected, small city, 19,500 population in the Bay Area. Um, straddle the role of being in that as well as resident of the area, because I know after my term, I will come back to being resident. And what drove me to office was about um, among other things, the interest in maintaining our creek as pristine as possible. Um, so I, I just wanna to touch on this matter of evidence and legitimacy because the flip side of having science um, and the results of, sci of a scientific approach yield data that will inform decisions are, and, and that and, and activism is that among the activists, there may be some, because I know at least from my experience and exposure in my own city, those that will have a voice but do not rely on that evidence. And um, so the legitimacy then is absent, um, in my opinion, as an elected official, because those are the folks who have figured out how to best make waves, but not bring forth solutions, create chaos, but not really be part of an overall strategy that involves them and other groups. Um, and elected officials and the city uh, resources. So um, I'm talking about people who jump to conclusions with, with misinformation. And so I think that point of having the source of data be a credible one, which is why when I saw the, um, the criteria by which um, AGU and Thriving Earth Exchange collects information, collects data, and instructs, orients participants in the projects about that, that is what I think, um, that is among the reasons that I, I sought being part of this and shared, shared that with the folks who are now leading our project in, in, in Pinole, where I am. So um, when I, I said I straddle roles, I also have to weigh what is um, a representative, a voice of a community versus someone, uh, and I'm not talking elected officials here, but anyone in a community who, who, who wants that limelight, <laughs> but in my opinion, not necessarily for good, common good. Um, 
And so I think we also have to be discerning about that when it comes to, to activism, you know, um, joining or being partners with other groups that support, um, support the causes that are of interest to us, along with the, with the principle that it's for a long, long-term, long-lasting effect for, for a broad community um, that to me is, 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 is important, um, because I, I do run into people who don't have that as a motivation, whether they are elected officials or community folks. So just wanted to bring that out because, um, it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing, um, challenge to me, both emotionally and psychologically, psychologically and, and intellectually, you know, to try to discern. And Terry, thanks for your energy and your and your thrust. You've, you've done it. You've done it the way I would like to see our community activists perform or behave. <laughs> Not they all don't, unfortunately. And so, uh, anyway, I appreciate it hearing from from all. I I had a question. Uh, for Rebecca. So Rebecca, when, when we first met, um, we were able to give you a small grant to do a protest. And I just, I was just staggered about how you, you had this huge billboard behind us. We didn't vote for you to flood us, Senator Inhofe. Um, and then you had all everyone wearing t-shirts and everything. And then you have your beautiful newsletter that you write, which is a great communication tool, very powerful. And then to, uh, Tar Creek got listed with the American rivers as one of the most dangerous rivers in the country this year. And then you've worked with two different sets of scientists. And then when I spoke to you, you had like whole teams of other experts that you're working with from multiple different universities, public health, landscape architecture, and then you're doing the ordinance. And have you kind of come out and gone, actually, that wasn't a good strategy and we won't try that again. I, you know, I, I guess I wonder about your, your multiple workload of all these different things and do they, does one benefit the other? And, you know, are there lessons learned that you kind of, I'll never do that again. I wouldn't recommend that for someone or. Um, well, yes, there, there are. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but the list isn't very long because it's, it is uh, this whole thing, my whole life doing this, it's like, um, it's like a candy store. You know, each piece is just perfect. <laughs> and it's just looking at you and you just know that that's the one. So uh, <laughs> maybe it's a chemistry set. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been good. And I think uh, it, it, certainly our site and the things that we're dealing with are, uh, it, it, it takes, um, it's, it's going to take all these pieces to finally fix this place. Uh, and so uh, to be tunnel vision and only do one thing, uh, it'll never get done. But uh, for, for us, yeah, it's pretty cool to um, see what bubbles up. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do wanna tell you that the, um, the, the Harvard School of Design course, uh, we hope to have all of their designs coming this uh, this fall um, so that the community members can all see uh, as as it's revealed to the city and the and the uh, federal agencies they uh, some great new ways of looking at the site and when you think about science um, that particular course each week there was a scientist of some sort uh, attending it and giving direction to the students that were uh, master level students of, of landscape architecture, how to, to look at uh, phytoremediation or hydrology, how do you use this to do that? Um, so it wasn't just the lay of the land, 
that would could be done and, uh, differently, but how do you repair the land? How do you repair the water? How do you deal with acid mine water? How do you deal with mine water trapped in the aquifer? How do you uh, how do you deal with all of those things? So yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's a deal. <laughs> Liz, you had a question in the chat. Would you like to pose that? Yeah, thanks so much, Erin. Um, thank you all for sharing your stories today. This has been um, really fascinating to, to listen to. Um, I thought it was really interesting um, when Dawn was telling her story earlier, um, she talked about the fact that uh, when she started talking about wildlife, all of a sudden people were paying attention who hadn't been paying attention before. And it was a, a new way to message, you know, the, the same issue she wanted to get across, but all of a sudden people were listening to her. I'm curious if others have had similar experiences with the messaging, if there was something that you were able to start talking about that maybe you hadn't originally thought about as being, you know, the, the important thing that people would listen to you about. Um, and then after you start talking about that or bring that into the conversation, that you then were able to uh, get, you know, community members or policymakers interested in a way that they weren't before. Thanks. Well, I know our community, it, it didn't start out with wildlife. I can tell you that um, the group that had started before me, it, um, we have 200 acres of land, it's an abandoned golf course um, in this gated community. Right now we have 1,250 homes, we're overdeveloped. And two developers here wanting to add 500 plus homes. And um, so the group before me was all about the safety of the community and the, our flooding issues because we are right next to a wildlife refuge that's all wetland. Um, so it, it, me being a, um, a nature photographer and, and walking out my back door and seeing the amazing wildlife, I was like, why not bring wildlife into it? You know, after, I mean, I, a lot of people in the community have seen wood stork here, which is on the endangered species list. We just don't know if it's nesting here because an environmental impact statement was not done. So that's something we had to look into. And calling Fish and Wildlife, I found out there is an endangered plant growing on the farm across from us. And we don't know if that's here. And it's not a law to have that done, to have an environmental impact statement or survey done, which it, it should be. And, and especially like in an area like this, when we're so close to a, a refuge and we have so much wildlife. Um, so, I mean, I brought wildlife into not, you know, the, along with the safety of the community with only one entrance and exit. And the developer has no plans of adding a second entrance or exit. Uh, we have one road that 25 HOAs have to get to. So, and, and then I find a creek that comes through Island Green that, that actually starts from the Waccamaw River, comes through the refuge and completely through Island Green. So I got my, I, I noticed this creek from looking at Google Earth. Like I said, Google Earth is my friend. Um, I, I documented it with my camera, um, taking videos. And that's actually how we wound up with a scientist. I documented this creek because every time we'd have a high tide or a king tide is what we have, um, the water were, would rise in Island Green. And um, Harriet got us in touch with Dr. Stephen Emmerman who looked at all my videos documenting this creek, which is, it's called Peach Creek. And, Come to find out it's not man-made. Everybody thinks that all uh, golf courses have man-made ponds or creeks and, and they don't. 
we have a creek that's it's been here it goes back as late as far back as 1943 and that's where our waters rise when the Waccamaw River rises it rises in island green and um so it it, it started at, at safety for the community and, and the flooding and I added nature and 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 then I, I find out a, about a, a, a natural creek that if developers destroy it in any way, which they have plans on building a two lane roads across this creek, um, it could not only uh, cause more damage to Island Green and flooding, but it could cause damage to the federally protected wildlife refuge next to us. So, and, and then um, the, the historical uh, logging train, it, it, there's a lot. It, uh, Island Green is actually pretty amazing. If, and you don't have to be a scientist uh, if you just uh, look at things around your community yourself, you know, um, see what's there, you know, just open your eyes to uh, what's around you. It, while documenting Peach Creek, I, um, I videotaped these snail shells that were all over the place. And um, the director of the, the wildlife refuge saw these snail shells in my video. And he's the one that said, um, it's a long shot, but why don't you uh, look for a bird called a limpkin? And um, I, I'd never heard of a limpkin before. I looked it up online and I said, you know, I think I actually videotaped that bird while I was documenting Peach Creek. You know, I wasn't even, I, I saw this bird. I, I took my camera and, you know, looked at it for a minute and went back to Peach Creek because that's what my focus was on, Peach Creek. And um, after seeing a picture of the limpkin online, I went back to that video. I sent it to uh, Craig Sasser, the at the refuge who sent my video to a gentleman from Fish and Wildlife who then had a birder friend of his come to Island Green. And that's when we found out that we had three rare limpkins living in Island Green. And it all took, it, it, it's because I videotaped something as small as a snail shell because I'd never seen so many empty snail shells all over the place, you know? And it, Harriet calls me a citizen scientist. I thought she made it up at first. <laughs> I had to look it up, <laughs> you know? I was like, hey, you know, I, okay, I am, you know, because it, it's in me to save this amazing 200 acres, you know, and, and not just for the people here, but for the amazing wildlife that's here. I mean, uh, we have a rare bird that's breeding. Um, we, we have otters. We, ha we might have an endangered species, species living here. We're just not sure. But um, it, it, it's amazing. And if you look hard enough, if you have the drive and the passion for it, you'll find something that you know, that could spark interest in a whole lot more people because I, I have had, we've had birders from all over come just to see our limpkins there and they document it on um, an app called eBird. And um, I'm thankful for that. And thankful that Craig Sasser from the Waccamaw uh, National Wildlife Refuge is on our side and that people from Fish and Wildlife are on our side. And it, it just takes looking around and um, seeing, seeing what you might have. And, it, and look at the crazy things. <laughs> I looked at a snail shell. I documented a snail shell on a video. There you go. <laughs> Rebecca, that makes me think of the health impacts 
Was that kind of a turning moment for your community when people were realizing how much lead poisoning was happening and then realized maybe a, an Orange Creek is not a great thing to have? Yeah, all, all of those things, it, it adds up. But uh, on Dawn's story, I, uh, one of the pro, uh, proponents of our um, petition this year is uh, a, a man that lives and uh, in, in, has property right on Tar Creek, and it was the wood ducks that got him. It was the wood ducks that um, didn't come back that uh, he had always liked to see. But um, it was the wood ducks that, that brought him in. He walked in the back door at our office and had to tell that story. So, um, and so he's bringing it forward and, and out, uh, not healthy and out knocking on doors um, for this, for that creek. Uh, so it is, it is the tiny things. You're right, Don, it is. It's when people begin to care about a place and what's there and what's not there. When it's not there, uh, that, that's important to you when they have remembered it. And for us, it, it was the fish. We didn't have fish. So in 42 years ago, they all died. And they were slowly coming back two years ago. There was a fish camp. And that's fresh on everybody's mind because uh, 10,000 little fish that were coming back to this creek died that, 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 with that spill. And everybody remembers that. And they don't want that happening again. They want, they want a creek again. They, so it's, it's, it's little things that can matter when you want them back. Yeah. But that, uh, Harry, responding to your, the health question, every single day, there's someone I know that's uh, now having to go to dialysis that's been diagnosed with the kind of cancer I never heard of uh, uh, and, and having treatment but not telling anyone. Uh, it's, it's remarkable in how many are, are um, in the nursing homes that too young to be there, but they, they no longer can, um, they've lost they, they've lost their ability to live on their own with uh, a Parkinson's-like condition or they've lost their, the dementia has set in um, too soon. People are in, I know that it's just too soon. So it's health, it's health and always the health of the people that um, is, is a motivator. Um, Rebecca, if I may, and, and anyone else. So there's another group of scientists, not particular to environmental issues, but population health. And that's, so schools of public health, I've not heard those mentioned just yet, but if you, right. yeah. Um, can yeah, we've been, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we did have, and we have still a good relationship with the Harvard School of Public Health. But, and we're uh, a, a partner with them for uh, probably 10 years. And when, all of their scientists that were working with us scattered like they do. Um, we've kept contact with all of them. And one in uh, head of CDC's uh, lead prevention program and one at Mount Sinai Hospital. And, you know, so they've scattered, but they're, if we have a question, they will answer it that day. Um, we've, we've kept those relationships. And I think that's the other thing that we've, we've remembered to do is, is uh, to, uh, to keep them. And I mean, it's, it's been very valuable to us and it hasn't been the answer to everything, but um, uh, when you ask questions, sometimes you get answers. Sometimes the answers don't necessarily help you, but it helps you understand what's happened to the people and why why this particular thing can happen and when we understand that that's, well, that's what cadmium does. Oh, okay, yeah, that's what, you put ma that and manganese together. Well, that will cause this. And so it, it's helped us to understand uh, how, 
how disease and how uh, conditions where they may have originated for us uh, from our own exposures to the heavy metals. Thank you for mentioning that. Thank you very much. Norma, you're also a community leader. What's kind of motivating people around Pinol and saving the creek? What have you seen as some of the, the small things catching people's attention? Um, being annoyed at, <clears throat> at City Hall that there aren't enough people to clean it up, which is fine because that's if that's the motivation, you know, <clears throat> again, <laughs> being on the being uh, on the dais, we don't know everything as elected officials, you know, we come from the resident, we come from the community as well, different motivations, different interests in remaining in office um, uh, or not. Um, uh, my husband says, unfortunately, there are many, too many puddle jumpers, meaning, you know, they stay in office for a little bit and then they want, they really are there to seek a higher office. And, and as we all know, it takes a, a long period of time to, um, to uh, establish uh, new ways of, of behaving and, 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 and new policies that are going to have long, longer term positive effects or results. Um, but back to what motivates people locally. In our project, um, it's, it's especially uh, important that it be led by the community group, which has been focused on the creek, and that's Friends of Pinole Creek Watershed. Uh, so I am part of that group um, as the liaison to City Hall, but but continually remind us, even in that small leadership group, that the group that's going to remain with this work, if you will, and to encourage um, more than the usual membership of an or already organized group is Friends of Pedal Creek Watershed. The, the, the tie there or the uniting um, topic or, or subject is the creek. Um, and whether it's for recreation as an amenity whether it's for as a habitat for the flora and the fauna there, or whether as a as a channel to uh, divert otherwise what would be uh, flooded conditions, um, it's going to remain there. Um, our here in California, we're facing a drought. Uh, it's, it's not the, the first time, so you know, it's not flowing. But we certainly then can see it, what, the litter that becomes more obvious, um, and, and that is even for aesthetic reasons, even if it's as simple as that. People don't like to see litter. You know, we have many of those individuals. And so our challenge, whether it's Friends of Pinot Creek Watershed or being part of that leadership, small leadership group, is to, um, to take that disgust that people have about litter and be involved in helping us do some of the data collection uh, that then will be used more broadly not only for friends of Pinot Creek Watershed, but for whoever is um, in office locally and regionally, because we are part of a larger watershed. So that gets us into being able to communicate with additional information um, across the different jurisdictions that tend to be one of those barriers. Terry spoke about that. I think Don may have as well. You know, we've got the you've got your local uh, folks on council. You've got your um, county folks for the uh, unincorporated area as you've got your larger organizations that are um, presum well, presumably uh, low re uh, small resource, not enough resources, which we hear a lot, you know. Um, and so that remains whether you're in office or not, you've got to cross all these different, you've got to know what the boundaries are, and you've got to work with them. And all along, recognize that regardless of what those jurisdictional boundaries are, there's still that data that, that informs some of those folks who look at that and, and, and as well the others who look at the beautiful pictures because there, we've got multiple audiences. And so um, the motivation again right now <laughs> locally is we can't stand litter. <laughs> um, and hey, we're gonna use that. That's a start. Well, I'd love to hear from Michelle, Nicole, or Anna, if any of you are willing to speak up about what you're seeing in the communities you're in or working with. What are some of the key motivators to get people interested? 
Well, I can't speak too much for the community I'm working with uh, through Thriving Earth, you know, directly since I'm kind of guiding as that fellow. Um, but something that, a question that I've had, if I can kind of divert a little bit, um, you know, I think a lot of people have touched on this today, particularly Norma. Um, when you're confronting or you're running up against someone that maybe has an inherent distrust of either science or the nature of the problem, right? Um, like they say, you know, one bad apple spoils a bunch and maybe there's a reason for that mistrust, but it sounds like really the communication strategy and honing in on what's important to each individual is kind of the key to get over that hurdle. Um, but I am just curious if, if you've ever run into any situation where, you know, from a scientist's perspective, I'm always like, well, data, here's the data, here's proof, but that doesn't always resonate. So I'm um, sorry, it's a little bit different than what you, what you posed, but that's been the question um, kind of in the back of my mind. Questions are also welcome from everybody. <laughs> So um, let me share something that I learned from our own group. Um, so, uh, people, and again, using that simple example of litter, some people love to be out there picking this up. It shows that they are involved, right? It shows, it, it's got some immediate rewards. <laughs> litter, no litter. I picked it up. Great. I did my share. When, it, when it's come time to discuss amongst us and the project that, yes, there's that to be done, but there's also a systematic way to do it so that it can inform um, and, and have some legit legitimacy to it, the data collection part. Then we have began to have these discussion, discussions about, okay, how will we encourage people to take the time because it takes more time to do that than just picking up and, and, and putting in trash bins or trash uh, bags, right? So what, what helped uh, among our small group, um, the, the leadership group of our project was to use one key word that really kind of lit the light bulb um, and, and, and some of us know this because of our own practice of using data for our own work, but again, talking about those folks who may not be so keen on this is the action that can be taken. So actionable data, that was so, it, just adding that one term, it's, we're not just gonna collect things for collection's sake, it's going to lead to something. It's going to, we're going to use this toward, uh, toward an effort. Um, it, it just made more sense to one of the individuals on our team who is key to encouraging others who are more likely interested in you know, just picking up, picking up litter. We need both. We need those who are oriented a little bit more toward the data collection piece and those who want to simply do the other. And that's fine. So again, it speaks to to the need to collaborate and, and attend to the different interests, even among volunteers. Uh, for one, they don't necessarily have the time. They don't we don't necessarily have the time to have everyone adopt what we believe uh, as soon as we need them to. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. But early on in my career as a health educator, I used to go for, you know, the, oh, the challenge of convincing people that they, you know, need to do X, Y, Z that they didn't, weren't aware of before. And now I go for those who are interested and, and, and try to build, the, have that snowball effect. One interested person is going to inspire in their own way, someone else, and maybe not even in the way that I know how, and that's fine. At least we have that many more. Thank you so much for that. I, I love the actionable data and, and yeah, and remembering that we don't have to, we don't all have to see exactly the same thing in exactly the same way to care about the same thing. Um, so I think that's really powerful. Thank you. Beautiful. Right, and, and that's what I wanted to add too. When, when I had said the safety and the infrastructure um, and economics, I, I was very fortunate, so to speak, to in my area, this is the fast or this is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. Um, there's a lot of real estate um, transactions going on. And of course, you know, we're known for our tourism and, and that's, that leads the whole state. We, we essentially carry the whole state um, economically. So, um, and, and being along the intercoastal waterway uh, that 
is primarily used for recreational purposes now. Um, not very much um, transport gets put down through um, because most of it comes in through the ports in Wilmington and Charleston. They don't necessarily drag it along the intercoastal anymore. So that's where I was able um, to mobilize more people's interest because that's the area that you know was being affected so everyone has an interest you know in in tourism and and, and because that's where we earn our money and so if you don't have safe structures and um your safe habitats for people um and when, and when they started to realize you know how it affected them um, where your house may not necessarily flood per se, but if there's even, if there's under a foot of water on a road, EMS cannot go through it. They're, they're not allowed. And a lot of people didn't realize that until people were, until EMS was called and couldn't go through. Um, so that was a big thing with people. Um, they started to get scared. Um, and so, you know, you want they where you want to enhance things, we need to have better infrastructure and 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 what have you. And is it would it is it financially better that you move this certain set of people or you dredge out the waterway or you know, you do the feasibility studies. Um you know, maintenance, the, the um, stormwater maintenance is a big thing. And, you know, they're always behind on these, it, on these projects. You know, in my area, they're three to five years behind on their stormwater projects. And it's sad because they can't, you know, that we have all these people that are moving here and all this development going on, you know, they're, they're um, uh, approved building permits they had already they were three years behind on those um so you know it kind of felt like you know we were fighting a losing battle you know like with the fill and build and all of these you know old outdated regulations and codes that they had and, and you know even our FEMA maps were 12 years behind um so it just felt like we were fighting this losing battle, but we actually turned it around and we could say, well, look, you know, there's nothing we can do. You can't stop it. You know, you're not going to stop that water per se coming in. You're not going to stop the people moving here and the building and the developing. So let's just do it right. You know, and let's get the people out of harm's way and then, you know, build back right if we can. So. All right, I think we're getting close to the end of this call. More and more people are dropping off as we get close to five o'clock Eastern time. So I'd like to wrap up by asking um, Kirsty, Jessica, Haley, I'd love to hear from you. Liz, what are some of the lessons you're hearing as, as folks who work a lot in communication and engagement in politics. What have you heard our community leaders talk about in particular with regard to community mobilization? Um, Maybe just a couple sentences. What have, what have been the key lessons? Kirsty, you go ahead. Sure, I'll start. I, um, so one thing I've kind of heard in thinking about that trust piece, which I think in with community mobilization, trust is where you've got to start. And if that's a major challenge, um, it seems like based on your experiences and also based on just the community mobilization literature, that identity is, is a really important thing to reflect on, how, people, how you identify as a community, how you identify with one another, and just taking the time to actively listen to one another's concerns, even if you disagree with them or on, not on the same um, wavelength, is a really important good start to getting your community mobilized. Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, you know, something that uh, 
Jessica mentioned earlier in the chat that really resonated with me is that just um, thinking about, you know, we talked earlier about um, actionable data and also what is the, you know, actionable motivation? What is the thing that uh, people in the community care about that is connected to the issue? Um, and that comes back to identity too. Um, every community is different and the people within those communities are different. Um, and so connecting on that personal level and then sharing your experiences and creating that um, common experience and a sense of community around the issue is uh, the key to mobilization. Um, and it takes a whole lot of listening and, and observation, observation and care, um, which can feel almost passive when you talk about it that way, but it's what leads to action, great action and change. Yeah, great points. I totally agree with those. I think finding common ground is uh, a story that I've heard over and over again today, and that's incredibly important in something else, which is also really valuable, which is building partnerships and relationships and finding sometimes unlikely partners, you know, the ones who you didn't think would be, um, you know, particularly behind your cause, or you didn't even think of them as a particular group or person who might support, but sometimes having those unlikely partners gives you so much more strength. I was hearing so much about persistence and perseverance and opportunism. <laughs> so persistence, like it just is a really long haul. Um, these are major issues often so intertwined with culture and politics and history and uh, racism and, and, and all of these really deep, deep issues that, you know, we've been as a country building for hundreds of years and trying to deconstruct for uh, probably a much smaller amount of time. Um, and so, you know, that perseverance of like, if something doesn't work, I'm going to try a different tactic. You know, I'm going to try photos. I'm going to try throwing rocks. I'm going to try showing up at someone's house. I'm going to try contacting this other person door to door knocking. Like, I'm going to try something. And a little bit what I heard too was like trying to bring other folks in with you, right? Like, and I just think about all of the, work that goes on, like the emotional work that goes on. I know, Terry, you, you know, spoke a little bit about this and others like this is such emotional, personal, deeply personal work and to take care of yourself, take care of others, bring others on board. So you're not shouldering um, that huge burden alone and opportunism, you know, just find out, you know, when, when the events are happening or the you know, this policymaker slips up or there's someone that's going to be in your neighborhood, you know, take that opportunity and um, yeah, and gratitude. I think there's a good amount of gratitude here, which is really important to keep us going. Hey, thank you all so much for joining us today, for sharing your stories, your experiences. It's so powerful to hear all of this. Um, I'd like to ask if everybody is okay if we take some quotes from this and, and use those in other parts of our media, um, really show that gratitude and that enthusiasm and perseverance. Um, if anybody doesn't want that to happen, please send me an email. Um, otherwise, would really like to use some of this material because what you've shared today is so powerful. And we have a lot of other communities that are in various stages of super optimism or super depression and we want to be able to lift them all up and help them all create a lot of impact um yes anything that i have done said look i mean i look horrible all the time but you use use a way because that's what the purpose is um that's what i've done um and created for so anything that would help other communities and other people i would be very thankful and appreciative. <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry. It we makes appreciate it meaningful. You. Thank you. <laughs> Can I say something real quick? Please, Don. And I, I just want to say, um, and not to uh, make this a downer or anything, but um, I 
I do have a disability. Um, I suffer with IBS and I suffer with PTSD. And, and, and I still do this because it's in my heart. You know, even though I, I will have bad days and I can't get out to take photographs or document anything for weeks at a time, I'm stuck in my house all the time. You know, I, I can't get out to the, you know, the courthouses or whatever to get documents or anything. I do everything at my house. And I, my PTSD has, has come up a few times. Most recently, um, a, a resident um, shot an alligator in our community. I saw it with my own eyes. And um, I mean, I can, I can tell you there with, and especially, you know, dealing with IBS, I, it, it's the stress and the hair pulling out that, you know, it's like, you know, my fiance tells me, you got to stop, you got to stop, you know, this is, making you worse, but I can't because it means so much to me. It, it, and it means so much to the people here. Their safety it, with having one entrance and exit. And it, if we, right now, like I said, 1,250 homes are here. If we had to evacuate it, it's all these people trying to get to one road to get out of here. It, it's going to be chaos, but I still do it. And it, it's like, I, I mean, there, I've had really bad days. I've cried my eyes out, but it's in my heart to do, to do this. So, I mean, I know what Terry is going through with, you know, with the emotional stuff, I mean, I've been there. I, I, you know, I deal with it almost every day. But to look out my back door and and see, they haven't clear cut behind me yet. And so I see otters go by my back door. I see um, red-shouldered hawks. I um, have a hummingbird feeder now. But that I can see from my computer looking out, you know, I, I see the uh, Island Green is alive. It's alive with so much wildlife and nature and history and, and, and it, it, it would suck really bad if all this was gone because a developer wants to make money and I'm not going to let that happen. I'll be damned my disabilities. You know, it, I'm fighting for it because it means that much to me. And maybe I'm selfish because I'm a nature photographer, you know, and, and I love taking photographs of everything around here, but I, I know it's more than that. I know it's more than that. You know, and I might suffer daily, you know, with my stomach or whatever. But when I look outside, I'm happy as hell. So I know what you're going through, Terry, believe me. And others may pull their hair out too, but you know, it. if you feel it in your heart, that you know it's right. And like I told, I said something to Kirsty yesterday, you know, um, we live in houses, but we live in the nature and wildlife's home. Th that's their home. You know, what, what's what I see every day outside my back door, that's their home. And we're in a house in their home and they were here first and, and I'll save it for them too. <laughs> Absolutely. That's not a downer at all. That's so inspiring and such a beautiful note to end on, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no, no sorries. That's exactly, I think you said it beautifully. If, and I think at the heart of it, if you are 
really invested in this. People will see your example and be brave enough to, to follow and to join the cause and to be brave themselves. So thank you all for all the work that you do for being here today and sharing that. And I look forward to speaking with many of you at the upcoming community leader call. Have a great rest of the week and please be in touch if any of us, I, I think I speak for all of us here from AGU, Kirsty, Jessica, everybody, um, we are here to help you. Please reach out to us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye y'all. Bye y'all. Yeah.